Hello, and welcome to session number seven of the 23rd Annual Northwest Interlibrary Loan and Resource Sharing Conference. Today's date is September 22nd, 2023. This session is titled A Controlled Digital Lending Service, Progress, Pivoting, and Next Steps, and will be presented by Jean Zolag and Naomi Chow. My name is Katie DeVette, and I am the convener for this session. This session is being recorded with permission from the presenters. Because they retain the copyright to the information they are presenting, they may choose to request its removal from public viewing in the future by written request to Northwest ILL. However, at this time, it is planned that recordings will be made available once captions have been added. Attendees will be notified when recordings are available. To turn live captioning on, Click the CC link at the bottom of the screen and select Show Subtitles. If you have a question during the session, please use the Q&A function in Whova, and I will pose these to the presenters at the end of their presentation. We will not be monitoring the chat for questions. When the presentation ends, please complete the post-session survey in Whova located on the conference homepage and soon to be dropped in the session chat. Northwest ILL and its presenters appreciate and use your feedback. On that note, Jean, Naomi, welcome and enjoy your presentation. Give me one moment, I'll get your slides for you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, sorry, we had a little glitch here, um, but we're ready to go as soon as Katie gets our slides up. Um, in the meantime, I'm Jean sitting here in Manoa Valley. Here we go. All right. And I'm going to hide my face here. Uh, Katie, I forgot how to do that. <laughs> App video. Stop Lower video. Left. Okay, got it. Okay, here we go. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to you. It's morning here about eight o'clock. So Naomi and I are very pleased to join you today. I am Jean Dolag, as I said, I'm the Access Services Librarian and the Department Head of Access Services at Hamilton Library at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. I'm joined today with my wonderful colleague, Naomi. I'm sure some of you in the audience today have worked with Naomi before and know how wonderful she is. She is our interlibrary loan librarian extraordinaire. So we are so pleased to be here today to talk about our controlled digital lending service, our progress, our pivoting, and our next steps. I would just like to say a quick shout out to the presenters and the organizers. I've attended as much as I can given the time zone um, the last two days, and I have gained so much from your presentations and the, the colleagues that have posted. So thank you. All right. Next slide, please. So a little background to us. We are the flagship of the UH system. We have 10 campuses spread over the six major islands. We are a research one institute. With this last year, we brought in extramural funding grants, et cetera, and the tune of 5.15 point, I mean, $515.9 million. A lot of research going on. We have collections, about 3.5 volumes, a million, 2.5 million microfilms and fish and microcards. And we have 600,000 ebooks, plus more with our consortial partners. So probably about a million uh, access to. Our FTE at this campus is 18,000 students. Collection highlights, of course, are our extensive Hawaii and Pacific Island collections, our Asia collections and maps and more. I'd like to try a little poll if Katie can pull it up. We have two questions for you to get a sense of who's doing CD or how much you know or are aware of CDL and who's using CDL. Will it come up there, Katie? Maybe not. I'm not seeing your poll right now, but you could ask your question and we can have folks weigh in in the chat. Okay. Um, so the first question without my poll is, I guess, was how is your comfort level or your awareness of CDL from you know, nothing to a little bit, 
quite a bit and very comfortable with CDL, familiar with it. What happened to my polls? And then the second question was, who's using CDL already to some extent? That would be a yes or a no. So reading quickly through the chat, the level of comfort is all over the map. Uh, okay. there's a lot of no's is not using with, and there's a few people who are using it and some who are only using it for reserves and some who are using it a little bit. Great, that helps. Okay, then. So go to the next slide, please. Thank you, everybody. And sorry for that little bumpy. Um, okay, so in this session, we will talk about our progress um, with our CDL program since 2018. Some of you have, may have been in our session last year. Um, so we'll try to update you on where we are now. We'll provide you a little bit of data on our requests and fulfillment, particularly for our ILL CDL. We will talk a little bit about the 2023 Hachette versus Internet Archive lawsuit and how that's impacted our library and CDL services. And then we'll tell you a little bit about what our plans are to rescope our CDL services now and going forward with it. Next slide, please. I'm going to ask Naomi now to, to talk to you a little bit about the background of CDL. Um, for those of you who are already fully aware, drink your coffee. And for those of you who are kind of new to CDL, we hope this helps. Go ahead, Naomi. Okay, so we want to bring with a quick overview of controlled digital lending, also known as CDL, as some of you joining us today may be new to the idea of it. CDL is the digital equivalent of traditional library lending. A library can digitize a book it owns and lend out a secured digital version to one user at a time in place of the physical item. CDL has three core principles. One, a library must own a legal copy of the physical book by purchase or gift. Two, the library must maintain an own to loan ratio, meaning that the number of digital loans for a specific title must equal the number of physical books owned of that title. And three, the library must use software to ensure that the digital CDL book cannot be copied or redistributed. Next slide, please. So how does it work? You utilize software to create an online temporary loan with an assigned due date or expiration date, providing secured, controlled, read-only access to the content. There is no built-in ability to copy in part or in its entirety. The physical book must be sequestered, meaning it is unavailable while the digital content is in use. Next slide, please. Lending is an exception to copyright law. US copyright law allows for a legal exception called the first sale doctrine. This allows the person or entity that opens the league that owns the legal copy of a copyrighted work, the right to sell it, display it, or otherwise dispose of it. This includes the ability to loan books, which is how libraries can legally lend books. Next slide, please. Although a copyright holder has a right to protect and restrict the use of their content through copyright law, the concept of fair use can be applied in order to weigh and balance copyright against the use of the content to promote the furthering of knowledge and creativity. Jean will, pro will provide further insight regarding fair use later on. Now back to Jean. Next slide, please. Mm, not sure what's happened to Jean. Sorry, I turned my microphone off. Here I am. Okay, okay. <laughs> sorry. Now let's talk a minute about our library's journey to shine light on restricted items. In 2018, we became aware of the CDL white paper. 
And if you haven't read it, we encourage you to begin there. At the time, we, we were interested in applying CDL for our ILL requests of non-circulating special collection items, particularly for our Hawaiian and Pacific Island collections. So we received many requests for these items from our UH system students and faculty on the other Hawaiian islands, and also a good number through our ILL. We approached the library in, in uh, administration about piloting it, but had no organizational support. And so unfortunately at that time, no further action was taken. In 2019, we had a change in library administration with a new university librarian who was supportive of controlled digital lending. And then of course, we all know that in March, 2020, we had the COVID pandemic. Providing more access during this period led to some real world applications like Hathi Trust and Internet Archives. And that led us to actively pursuing, pursuing control digital for our course reserves and our digital ILL of interlibrary loans. Our university librarian tasked us to start CDL for course reserves by fall 2020 too. And with assistance from our university legal counsel, we considered legal risks and received the okay to proceed with some restrictions. We examined, examined potential software applications and developed a work plan to move forward with the implementation. So I think the map that speaks for itself that Hawaii, that little speck in the middle, which is really all the little islands that make up the state of Hawaii, it's geographically remote. The state is also spread out over several islands. We have interest system resource sharing to six Hawaiian islands where we have campuses. Our goal for access services is to expand access to resources and CDL is one important tool for us to accomplish this. Next, please. By the way, the map there is an older version of the Hawaiian Islands. I kind of liked it. So it's from, I believe, 19 or 1886. It's in the Library of Congress's collection. And I believe we have a copy downstairs in our map collection. So access across UH campuses. As I said, we have six campuses. We have to somehow provide equitable access to our resources for UHM and the whole system, students and faculty. We have students who take the same course um, across all the islands. It's a required course on Hawaii. Um, and so they need access to the Hawaiian collection, but we don't lend those books out. So we have to get very creative about how we can do resource sharing. Need to mitigate impacts to their education. That's kind of what I'm talking about. It's not fair that the students in the course on Pacific Studies 100 here have greater access to all the things on the fifth floor here and the students over in Maui don't. So CDL is one way we can help level that playing field. So our goal is to expand access via remote means. So meanwhile, though, we are trying to apply strong fair use arguments in doing so. Next slide, please. So for, C, for us, CDL is definitely a way to expand our resource sharing, our treasures, those materials uniquely held by us that are rarely held also by any libraries in the world. Yearly, we get many requests from libraries and independent researchers from around the world and annually, about 30 to 40% of our ILL requests are not filled because they're non-circulating uh, status and or, you know, they're rare, etc. We also have researchers who make repeated visits to the library to view items at a great personal cost. For early career researchers, funding research visits to Hawaii or even hiring a local research assistant our challenges and present barriers to their research endeavors. So CDL, of course, then is a way of reducing impact on travel time and costs for researchers and expanding asks, access to fulfill ILL requests. Next page, please. So let's look at a brief 
again at our timeline. When we started our CDL exploration, we spoke with different libraries and consulted our legal counsel. We described our workflow needs and sought software solutions for adoption for course reserves first. Although in the meantime, Naomi and the Hawaiian and the Pacific collection librarians had initiated CDL using Occam's Reader. Next, we purchased software and set up the workflows for CDL for course reserves using DLSG's DSE content server and MyDocs. We implemented this, as I said, for faculty and students in fall of 2022. For more details about our process to do that, you can see our Northwest ILL 2022 presentation. We were moving along nicely. We thought using CDL for course reserves and select ILL loans, and then March came in like a lion with the lawsuit against Internet Archive. Our library put a temporary halt on CDL. So now I'm going to turn it back over to Naomi, who will share a bit of numbers about our CDL cases, which shows the impact CDL has had to date expanding access to our resources. Naomi, over to you. Okay, so, excuse me, this slide shows our library's CDL statistics up till March 28th, 2023. The use of CDL to access whole book content for course reserve materials numbers 10 book titles with a total of 219 uses, averaging 21 uses per title. Our CDL reserve our CDL for reserves is fairly low, likely due to our excluding application to recent textbooks, which are considered to be a higher liability by our, by our university. CDL was, however, extremely useful for in-copyright novels that were out of print or difficult to obtain. CDL made access more convenient for the students enrolled in the courses by reducing wait time between checkouts and 24-7 availability. For ILL, our library applied CDL to 242 loan requests. Most were non-circulating books from the Hawaiian and Pacific collections. We averaged 11 to 12 CDL loans per month. CDL was not applied to book titles that were widely held at other libraries. In terms of workload, the CDL process for both course reserves and ILL is labor intensive using the current technology available. We look forward to future improvements to help reduce the amount of manual processing and to reduce turnaround time. Next slide, please. Many of you may be aware of the legal ruling on the lawsuit of Hachette versus the Internet Archive made on March 24th, 2023. Four publishers, Hachette, HarperCollins, Wiley, and Penguin Random House, sued the Internet Archive regarding physical books that were digitized and made freely available to the public as CDL loans. The ruling was in favor of the publishers and against Internet Archive's claim of applying fair use for their CDL loans. This put quite a rainy day damper on many libraries who were doing controlled digital lending. Internet Archive plans to appeal the ruling. Next, I will go through some basics of the lawsuit to show how it has impacted our CDL program. Next slide, please. Here's a little more detail to flesh out the case taken from articles from National Public Radio and Time. The publishers accused the Internet Archive of mass copyright infringement for loaning out digital copies of books without compensation or permission from the publishers. The judge agreed with the plaintiffs, saying that the Internet Archive was making derivative works by turning print books into ebooks and distributing them. It no longer has the right to do so after the ruling. Next slide, please. So what is the Internet Archive and how does it relate to brick and mortar libraries? 
The N Internet Archive is a nonprofit organization that curates and collects items in digital formats. In essence, creating libraries that the general public can openly and freely use or borrow, including the archiving of web pages through the Wayback Machine and digitizing print books to curate the open library that provides access via CDL. It has the characteristics of a library and is thus an online library. Next slide, please. With the Internet Archive directed to halt their CDL for in-copyright books for the four publishers, our library administration suspended CDL for course reserves and ILL lending operations from March 28, 2023. This meant, first, no new CDLs could be created. Everything was halted wherever they were in the process. And second, our active CDLs were left to expire on the preset expiration slash due dates. Note, this was our library's more cautious response to the legal storm. Other libraries may have continued with CDL dependent upon their interpretation of the ruling and their risk assessment. Next slide, please. In terms of straight numbers, the impact of suspending CDL on course reserves between March and September of this year was that one course CDL was turned down. The students were thus required to come in person to the library to access the book. For ILL lending, 50 loans were rejected as unfilled that could have been shared as CDL loans. 45 of the items were from our collections in Hawaiian and Pacific and five from other special collections. Next slide, please. After several months of negotiation and clarification through an injunction, the Internet Archive announced on August 11th, 2023, that the judge had signed an order in favor of the Internet Archive, agreeing with our request that the injunction should only cover books available in electronic format and not the publisher's full catalog of books in print. The ban on Internet Archive CDL thus applied only to titles that had commercially available ebook counterparts. Next slide, please. And here's an explanation from publicknowledge.org. The publisher's entire case, the judge reasoned, was based on works for which they were already producing ebooks. That was the basis of the complaint, the fair use analysis in the case, and the judgment itself. Books for which there were no officially licensed ebooks presented an entirely different fair use analysis, which neither of the parties had briefed. The publishers could not, the judge held, use a settlement to backdoor a ban on lending a much broader class of works than had been at issue in the suit. And this added nuance is why we were given the okay to resume CDL at our library. And now back over to Jean with the next slide, please. Hi, Jean, I think you're on mute again. <laughs> yep, I'm on mute again. So I wanted to add to what Naomi said about the numbers for the course reserves was rather low. One, because it was textbooks, but also with all of that CARES money, we were able to buy a lot of digital uh, ebook versions to help the faculty so that students would not have to come into the library for paper um, a course reserve. So that kind of, we were a little disappointed in the number, but now that we've turned it back on, we're getting some more requests for um, CDL course reserves. So it is turned back on. Um, we're gearing back up. Uh, we're a little stretched right now for staffing to actually do the scanning for CDL, but we're working on that. So our caveat, though, for CDL is that we look to make sure that the books are not available as a commercial ebook. We apply the four factor fair use analysis with every item we decide to CDL with an emphasis first on its market impact assessment and its non nonprofit educational use. We've also created uh, a format to uh, document 
our fair use decisions. Um, it's an easy to fill Google form and it goes into a spreadsheet for now. And as Naomi said, we're looking for new developments for software applications that can help us streamline some of this work. Um, and so this to the next slide. Oh, what happened? Um, the next slide, please. Are we still there? It's the right one, Jean. Oh, okay. Oh, I see it. Yeah, there it is. Okay, so fair use analysis strengthens CDL use application is what we feel and we believe and we practice. It's a counterbalance to copyright. It's an exception, as the law says, to the rights of copyright owners and fair use is vital to the growth of knowledge and industry. Fair use is based on balancing the four factors set forth in the copyright statutes. You can apply it to a wide range of materials and activities. Fair use does not have to be defined by boundaries, but is flexible to meet changing needs and ensures that copyrights do not become too restrictive and that the law can enable new creativity based on existing works. In our first session of the workshop, um, the keynote speaker on CONTU and fair use you know, said many of the same things and we're repeating them here. Uh, you'll note at the bottom um, is copyright law for librarians and educators, the 2020 fourth edition by Kenneth Cruz. And if you're not familiar with Kenneth Cruz, he's been working in this area for quite some time and knows a lot about copyright law. So get the book. You can also look to um, Carla Myers's book on course reserves and copyright, which we found really helpful. Next slide, please. So we don't have a copyright librarian. And as many of you are probably in the same situation, but we did not let that hinder us. As we are gearing up for our CDL program, we attended several workshops and short courses to strengthen our understanding of copyright and fair use. Um, I heard um, yesterday the CDL lightning rod with Amanda, who also said she took some courses to brush up on um, copyright law and fair use. So they're out there, take advantage of them and make yourself feel comfortable with fair use. Um, we always apply the four factors um, in making decisions about what we CDL. Um, we also look at CDL too for um, music and videos and try to apply it and see if we can come up with a way to give limited access um, to some of our unique materials. Um, we look, of course, always, is this for a nonprofit educational purpose? And that may take a few emails back and forth until we're comfortable on what the requester intends to do with that, that um, uh, material. We also, of course, then look at the effect on the potential market, which has made us very careful about any kind of textbooks, commercial textbooks. Um, of course, we do look at the other two factors, um, for example, the nature of the copyrighted work, um, if it's music sheet music or a orchestra score, um, you know, those take a little bit more scrutiny, um, artwork, etc. cetera. Um, so then, as I said, if you don't have a copyright librarian, you can still make decisions on materials for CDL. So just brush up on the four factors and start using them would be our suggestion. So here we are today. The next slide, please. Our few, here's what we're doing now. Um, we, for our course reserves, not-for-profit educational use, no recently published textbooks, or if it's available in a e version, we purchase the ebook if it's commercially available. Uh, for interlibrary loan, of course, we check that it's for a nonprofit educational use uh, and it's to promote science and the arts. We restrict it to items not widely held at other libraries. And we focus on less available items, gray literature, one of a kinds, et cetera. And again, we don't do any CDL if there is a commercially ebook version available. Next slide, please. 
So this brings us to the end. Our summary, we feel that CDL is an essential resource sharing tool for us. It's necessary to provide equitable access for our UH system students and faculty across all the islands and in our distant education programs for course reserves and library use only materials to support their learning and research. CDL creates greater access to our library's unique non-circulating materials to help overcome our geographical remoteness and barriers. And we feel what we do is legal fair use. Last slide, please. So thank you, mahalo. And now we are ready for your questions and a discussion. And I will turn my camera back on somehow. Let's see Excellent. My Thank you so much. Uh, we do not currently have any questions in our Q&A over here. If you have questions for Jean and Naomi, please feel free to add them in. Here they come. Excellent. So the first question, when providing CDL of print materials, who does the digitization? And I think you may have spoken about this last year, but can you give us a quick rundown on how that works? Naomi. Well, for both of us, we're using students to do the initial scanning, but a staff member will review the items and then the staff member is the one who uploads it into um, the software for the conversion. So without our students, we wouldn't be able to do it. <laughs> uh, for course reserves, we have our course reserve um, specialist um, who oversees um, working with uploading it to the DSLG um, server that um, students access through my docs. So we have, you know, two, Naomi supervises the students that do the ILL, ILL CDLs and Carla, who presented with us last year, oversees the course reserves right now. So Katie, your, your thing yesterday is going to help us work through a lot of mapping of where we're doing okay. our work here. So we're very fortunate. We have a great student budget and a lot of students, and we can uh, have them do a lot of the scanning. Okay, any other questions? Excellent. So with that, several people would like to know what software are you using between the two departments? Um, for scanning? Naomi? For oh. scanning, for transmitting, for all the things. Uh, Naomi, okay. take it away. Okay, for interlibrary loan, we're using our scanner that we normally use for article scanning and such. So we're using a combination of the ScanX system. Um, right now we have a book edge, so that's a little slower. We are going to be getting an overhead for that, so hopefully that'll speed it up. We also use the DLSG overhead, um, but that's a little more complex. So that's for scanning. We then import it into our Occam's Reader um, program, which is actually the reserves program, but it's flexible enough that we can use it for IOL. And it, you can set an expiration date and create a link. That was what was very important for us, a link with a password. So it's really specific to one um, user, as opposed to the DLSG course reserves. That is a link that gets put into the course management system and um, there's a limit, but the there's no link to login per se that's restricted by student use because it's in the course management system. Um, for ILL, we have to send an email to the lending library. It's very manually based because um, we're not sure that the user quite knows what to do with it yet. Hopefully they do, but at some point um, it can be sent directly like an article exchange. Um, and for course reserves, it's a link or a QR code that the professor or instructor um, posts into the course management system. Um, I just would say, if you want to know how we decided what to use and how that process works, um, we detailed it in our session last year. Um, so if you're new to this. Very and we good. have a Nate. link on one of the early slides. So 
So link to last year's archive, and there should be some good stuff there too. Uh, someone else asked, does commercially available mean that libraries cannot buy it? There are several publishers like Elsevier that don't allow for library purchases, but students can buy them for themselves. That is a great question. I know we've got some books on course reserves now here that don't work that way. Mm, I can't answer that one. Um, you mean there Elsevier has ebooks? Repeat the question. <laughs> we, we've run into some issues locally where like a Pearson book that's being used in a course can't be purchased by the library electronically, but we can purchase mm. it physically. Or like a McGraw-Hill title, we can't purchase the most recent one at all. They're asking, can you do CDL for those kinds of things? We wouldn't do it. Nope. You have to look at the licenses too. You know, as you, I think you said, Elsevier, the licenses. We're trying, you know, everyone and Gwila are trying to negotiate for better licensing, but no, it's, we, yeah. It depends on your, your particular library's uh, risk assessment. Mm -hmm. Our general counsel specifically told us to stay away from recent textbooks. They understood that potential market place impact. So, um, for our library, we probably wouldn't touch that at all, those type of books. Sounds good. What recommendations do you have for those who are trying to advocate for CDL when they are negotiating with folks who may have a more conservative or risk adverse approach? Wow, good question. Um, well, make sure you're, you know, I think education people don't understand maybe the law copyright versus fair use um have your administration hopefully on board but have your administration talk to other libraries who are doing it i know we reached out to um i think our legal counsel actually talked to kyle courtney um, and reached out to other universities to get their legal counsel's opinion and um so that we do know in the early days, um, you know, have your, you know, have a, a short briefing paper, the white paper summarized to share with your administrations, um, you know, and just to to show that it isn't, you know, a terribly illegal thing. It does take time. It takes some thought, but it's not, um, you know, and then decide your risk factors. Does that, Naomi, you chime in? Um, yes, I agree with those. And I also think that if you come up with a goal for what you want to do with your CDL, that might make it a little easier, both in terms of explaining it to your administration and your general counsel, and also for you to control. Because um, it is at this point very labor intensive. So, um, but if you're saying it's for your distance ed students and you're trying to talk about equitable access, as Jean had said, you know, you're, you're framing it in a very specific type of use. Very good, very I, good. I can add something to what we did um, in the early days is we to make the faculty understand what CDL was and wasn't able to do. We ran a four part workshop series and we broadcasted across all campuses for librarians and faculty. And we had a really good turnout and that helped people to understand too. So, you know, maybe that's not the early stage, but maybe the second stage is to share it with library staff across the board. And um, so everyone is on the same understanding or basic understanding. Okay, next question. <laughs> Excellent. What sources do you check locally to check to ensure that there isn't an ebook available? I know some places need to check their Gobi account or Amazon. Do you have other places you're looking? Well, for um, us, it's probably OCLC also, just because you can see the, the vendor records early on. Um, and if other libraries have it in, an ebook format. You can also do a, a web search to see if the publisher has an ebook. Sometimes they have an ebook that is not necessarily something that libraries can purchase. It might be an individual purchase. So, Jean, did you have anything to add? No, that does it. I mean, anyone can talk to Carla, who's our uh, course reserve specialist who does all the searching for uh, ebooks for the requested course reserve books. 
Very good. Uh, do you have a collections tool that you're aware of, or does the community have one to identify works in the collection that are not published in ebook form? That sounds like it'd be really mm -hmm. handy if it does exist. No, but that's a good idea. Yeah, let's talk to Nakil. Nakil is our head of acquisitions, but he's also got great uh, database skills, and we just send him all these things. And can you write a script for that? So we'll we'll have to talk to Nakil. Uh, uh, great question, though. Good idea. Uh, we are looking forward to what's happening with NISO um, and standardizing, you know, make things interoperable for for controlled digital lending. And I think some of probably the software vendors are just kind of having, a, we think, a low profile right now until this Internet Archives thing. So we're looking forward because it is labor intensive. But, you know, you, you look at where we are in the map and trying to get things to people and things to us. This is really a... I need a tool for us. Questions, more questions. Excellent. I have a couple more folks asking about your software, but I think we've already attended to that. Uh, you mentioned that the documents are read only. Does this mean that they're image only PDF? Are they OCR or do they have other accessibility concerns that you have worked with? For ILL, it's not accessible. It's just a straight image because Occam's Reader is a picture. It's not a PDF that can be grabbed so easily. So it doesn't work well that way. Have point. you tried using the read to me function in Occam's Reader? Uh, we have. We've had some challenges with that. So, Reading but yeah, yeah. So, um, but Jean, what about uh, course reserves? I think um, that does Katie, have. Yeah, um, it does. Um, it's part of the DSLGD or uh, whatever. I never get the acronyms right, but the other program we use for course reserves, yes. And it's screen readable. And I think she does the color as well. Um, Katie, the other thing we have problem with um, some of the the uh, interlibrary loans is they're not in English. They're, uh -huh. they're Japanese, Korean. Chinese different languages so that gets a little challenging but uh, I remember someone asking yesterday in um, you know th that uh, some of the scanning stuff you can do in different languages um, so um, yeah but we, we are we do do that <coughs> to for accessibility <laughs> excuse yeah, me I, I think expanding our language bases for those is one of our next hurdles in accessibility just in general so with that, we have reached the end of our time. There are a few more questions in the Q&A section that Naomi and Jean can attend to afterwards if they would like. Uh, for the time being, Northwest ILL thanks everyone for attending this session. Please do take the time to fill out the post-session survey. This is a controlled digital lending service, progress, pivoting, and next steps. And the link can be found on the conference front page and will again be dropped into the chat if you've lost place of it. If you have enjoyed this session and want to continue the conversation, you are more than welcome to continue to use the chat within this session or move over to our community section of Whova, where you can use the chat boards or create a virtual meetup. And I'm sure Naomi and Jean would be happy to answer any questions they can wherever they can. So with that, thank you so much, Naomi and Jean. It's been great. Mahalo to all of you. Let's CDL together. <laughs> Thank bye you. Bye. 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 Thanks so much, Katie, for all your help. Okay, Naomi, good job.